1966, a professor at MIT named Joseph Weizenbaum created a program called ELISA. ELISA was created to simulate human conversation by mimicking the patterns of language used by the person talking to it. It would speak back to you, rephrasing and repeating what you had said. ELISA did not have any sort of intelligence or understanding of the conversations which it was having, or rather, the things being said to it. It was only designed to pick up on words and patterns in speech and mimic them back at the user, in a way reminiscent of a stereotypical how-does-that-make-you-feel type of therapy. Weizenbaum wasn't trying to trick anyone, and by all accounts, thought people would immediately realize how shallow their engagement with Eliza really was. Despite that, almost immediately, and much to Weizenbaum's shock and dismay, people began to attribute emotions and personality traits to her. Weizenbaum didn't have to try to trick people into placing their feelings upon a computer, because humans have a habit of anthropomorphizing things, and so people will do the work to trick themselves all on their own. There's even a term for this effect where humans project understanding and emotion upon a machine, the Eliza effect. Eliza was named for the character Eliza Doolittle from the 1913 play Pygmalion. In the play, Eliza, a poor woman who sells flowers in the street, is taught to speak properly in order to pass her off as a duchess. Weizenbaum's reason for naming Eliza this was because, over time, he expected the scripts Eliza was using to converse would be iterated upon, and so, like Eliza Doolittle, the machine's speech would become increasingly refined over time. Naming this program after Eliza Doolittle and Pygmalion, however, was more prescient than Weizenbaum could have known at the time. The name of the play, Pygmalion, comes from a figure of Greek myth who fell in love with a statue of his own creation. He humanized, anthropomorphized, his own creation. In the end, his love for the statue is so strong and so pure that Aphrodite imbues the statue with life. We could spend all day unpacking how that metaphor relates to Eliza the character, but I'm more interested in pointing out how that metaphor perfectly fits Eliza the machine. While the program Eliza was like Eliza Doolittle from Pygmalion, the play, and was taught to speak like something it wasn't, we, the users, are like Pygmalion, the character. We cannot help but project thoughts and feelings onto machines. Weizenbaum had created one of the world's first chatbots, a program made to imitate conversation. Now, half a century later, you can't avoid them if you try. Whatever device you're using to watch this video on right now probably has some version of a chatbot installed on it. A computer you can talk to which can talk back, albeit with the clever branding of being an AI personal assistant, like Siri, Alexa, or Cortana. There's no functional reason Alexa needs to be able to hold a conversation with us. There's no reason why it needs to be able to tell me a joke on command. There's no reason we have to assign identities to the programs that execute voice commands, even if there is a practical advantage to having them speak back to you to provide feedback that your commands have been picked up. In Star Trek The Next Generation, for example, they called the computer computer, and not Tina or Sarah, and when they gave it a command, it didn't respond with a naturalistic, okay, let me do that for you, but with a cold, mechanical affirmative. Apple and Amazon and Microsoft have given these programs identities, the illusion of personalities, because of that Eliza effect. They know it will make users form a connection with them, and ultimately, more likely to form a loyalty to their specific brand. If you have an iPhone, you're just a little more likely to get another iPhone next time because that's where your good friend Siri lives. There are even chatbots which serve a romantic or erotic purpose. In 2017, for example, the app Replica was released, a chatbot advertising itself as a virtual friend. But people quickly discovered that if you tried to talk dirty to the AI, it was more than happy to reciprocate. 
While the company behind Replica denies that the app was ever intended for sexual uses, it's worth noting that the app built at the very least romantic uses into its payment model. As a free download, your Replica chatbot will be a friend, but for a subscription fee, you can change its role to partner or spouse. There are a lot of lonely people out there, and Replica was more than happy to sell the Eliza effect to them for a profit. I don't judge anyone who finds comfort in a dark time with apps like Replica or other chatbot programs. However, I'd be lying if I said I didn't think there was something unnerving about the Eliza effect, and about chatbots in general. Because there is an artifice to all of this. There is something uncanny about placing emotions upon what amounts to an inanimate object, even just talking to Eliza and listening to her talk back, like Tom Hanks trapped on an island talking to a volleyball. When something in life is uncanny or uncomfortable, even if it is harmless, it is ripe for exploration in the form of horror. This video is a double feature about two games I love, which share space in my mind, Doki Doki Literature Club and Slay the Princess. I'm not saying these games are exactly the same, or that everything I have to say about one could apply to the other, only that I want to tell you about both, and that I think they explore similar themes. Both of these games thrive on the idea that the characters you are speaking to are somehow real on a meta level. They want to make it seem like there is someone on the other side of the screen talking back at you. The horror of both of these games comes from acknowledging the strange nature of simulated conversation. They are stories about stories, and about the constructed nature of stories, about the constraints we put on characters and ourselves. They are both love stories, they are both horror stories, they are both great games, and I don't want to talk about one without talking about the other. Let's get into it, first, by talking about Doki Doki Literature Club. Doki Doki Literature Club is so ubiquitous in the video game YouTube space at this point that it's hard to imagine someone making it to this video without knowing this already, but Doki Doki Literature Club deals with extremely heavy topics, including depression, anxiety, abuse, and self-harm. If those things are triggers for you, this video is broken into chapters below. Please skip ahead to the Slay the Princess section of the video. Also, full spoilers for Doki Doki Literature Club and Slay the Princess Ahead. Go play them, they're both great. Doki Doki Literature Club is the brainchild of one Dan Salvato. Before DDLC, Dan had already made a name for himself online as a part of the Super Smash Bros. competitive scene, but more notably as a member of the Smash Bros. modding scene, working on Project M and creating 20XX Tournament Edition. DDLC even has a cute easter egg in-joke about Project M, as sometimes the loading screen content warning will instead say, PM died for this, which is probably not actually the case, but is very funny. In an article from Kotaku, published about a month after DDLC originally released, Dan Salvato said that the game was born from a love-hate relationship with anime and the trope of cute girls doing cute things, and that clearly extends to visual novels and dating simulators. It is a meta-narrative, and the medium is definitely the message here. This story would not work as a TV show, or a novel, or even a video game in a different genre. The twists and turns of DDLC are so iconic and memorable that they often draw all the attention away from the rest of the game, which is a shame, because Doki Doki Literature Club is more than its twist moments. Much more. Because of that meta-narrative, Doki Doki Literature Club in this video can refer to two different things. The game we're actually playing, and the game which, in fiction, we were supposed to be playing before things go wrong. Circles within circles, I know. This game has some of that House of Leaves framing device within a framing device within a framing device vibe going on, but try to stay with me. The game that Doki Doki Literature Club is supposed to be is a fairly straightforward visual novel about a faceless protagonist who gets roped into joining a literature club at school with only four members, all of whom are, in the protagonist's words, incredibly cute girls. This is an extremely straightforward, tropey setup for a dating simulator, which is the point. 
you do spend about 90 minutes to two hours, depending on your reading speed, going through this original version of Doki Doki Literature Club before things really start to take a turn. The big mechanical hook of Doki Doki Literature Club is that, aside from just picking dialogue options, getting each girl's route involves writing poems for them between each day of the story. This takes the form of looking at a set of words on a list and picking which ones you think the girl you're interested in will like. You'll get an extra scene with whoever you pick the most words for the following day, and they'll react positively to your poem. But if you pick too many of their words, the other girls, specifically Natsuki and Yuri, will start to lose interest in you and your poems, to the point where they'll eventually refuse to even read them. I like this. It breaks up the dialogue-heavy sequences a bit, and it's fun to try to gauge each girl's personality based on the words you pick. Some of the words chosen even foreshadow things about each girl that are revealed later on in the story. Like, why would a cheery girl like Sayori like words like depression, hopeless, or sad? Oh, I get it. The worst piece of criticism I see time and time again about Doki Doki is that the first act is something to be suffered through. To say that the game doesn't get good until the girls start dying, and to treat the opening hours as boring anime tropes getting in the way of the good parts. This is a mistake. The first half of DDLC is important. It's vital, and it's well written. In horror movies, there's this concept, this trope, which TV Tropes now calls developing doomed characters, but before they unfortunately renamed every article on the site, it had the much better name of 20 Minutes with Jerks. This is the idea that at the beginning of every horror movie, you need to establish your characters in order for the audience to feel anything about the horrors that happen to them later on. And so, the first 20 minutes of a horror movie are by necessity boring, because you have to learn about the characters in order to care about them dying. It's the party scene at the beginning of Cloverfield, or the first half of Seiko, which seems like it's going to be a film noir crime thriller following Marion until she's suddenly killed. This is, and I cannot stress this enough, not what makes the first half of Doki Doki Literature Club good. It is a knock-on effect that you get to know these characters before bad things start happening, but Act 1 of DDLC is not just there to contrast what happens later. In Act 1, in fiction, the game we're playing is not Doki Doki Literature Club the horror game, it's Doki Doki Literature Club the innocent dating sim. What gets talked past a lot when discussing DDLC, in my opinion, is that this Doki Doki Literature Club is a really good visual novel without the horror elements that come later. At the same time, this first act still builds that horror atmosphere because it is essentially impossible to play Doki Doki Literature Club completely spoiler-free. Not just because the game is so well known now, but because it opens with a warning that it's not suitable for children or those who are easily disturbed. This is a perfect example of where a certain amount of spoilers, of knowing what to expect before engaging with the game, improves the experience. This content warning is not just important so that people don't stumble across content that might hurt them, it makes sure players know that they are playing a horror game, and that knowledge itself begins building tension, especially when contrasted with the extremely colorful and cheery nature of the game. In other words, the knowledge that you are playing a horror game makes you start looking for the horror elements before they arrive, and makes you question whether it even is a horror game or not, or if it's just messing with you. You are waiting for the other shoe to drop, and that builds tension before the scares actually arrive, which makes them hit harder in Acts 2 and 3. The way I would describe Doki Doki Literature Club Prime, the game we're meant to be playing in fiction, is that it's a stereotypical dating simulator if all of the girls were dealing with serious and realistically depicted issues. Each of the girls fall into an archetype on the surface, but have struggles they are dealing with if you dig a little deeper. Let's talk about those girls, shall we? Monica is the popular girl anime archetype. She's the club president, the most popular girl in school, and generally speaking, unobtainable. She is the only one of the four girls without a route. You can't romance Monica, she exists to facilitate the other girls' storylines. For reasons that will become apparent, it's hard to talk about what Monica's personality is meant to be in the unaltered version of the game, aside from kind of blandly perfect. 
In the re-release, Doki Doki Literature Club Plus, the version available on consoles, there are extra side story scenes added to give more background and extra interactions between the girls. Because we never really get a chance to interact with the character Monica is supposed to be in Doki Doki Prime, these side story scenes are our best chance to learn about her. Monica is a perfectionist and a bit of a control freak. She cares about her friends, but she also sometimes oversteps, assuming that her way is the only right way to do things, or intervening in conflicts between the other girls that are really none of her business. Monica is the one of the girls who seemingly has her life the most together, but that might be because she wasn't meant to have a route. The backstory and development we'll get for the other girls didn't exist for Monica because in the original unaltered prime version of the game we play in Act 1, she was only meant to be a supporting character. Natsuki is the character in the game who gets the least development. This is somewhat addressed by DDLC Plus's side stories, but she doesn't end up holding the vital plot importance to the real game that Sayori, Yuri, or Monica do, which always left her feeling like a bit of an also-ran to me. Natsuki is the tsundere archetype. She's very hostile and bossy and guarded with her real feelings. She's the smallest of the girls, but with the loudest personality, and loves fashion, manga, and anything considered cute. She likes short and cute words. N not that she wants you to write poems for her or anything, baka. The reason Natsuki is so guarded with her feelings and puts on such a facade, though, comes from the really toxic way she's been treated by the people in her life. Specifically, throughout the game, we learn that the reason Natsuki is so small despite being the same age as the other girls is because her abusive father has a history of, among other things, withholding food or leaving her alone in a house without any food, which led to her growing up malnourished. Her love of baking is probably a result of this, giving her a way to be in control of food for the first time in her life now that she's a bit older. Outside of the club, she's also part of a really toxic clique of friends, the mean girls of the school, who gossip about everyone else. Because of this and her relationship with her father, she has a hard time trusting people and can be mean as a defense mechanism to hide her insecurities. Yuri is the mysterious, quiet one of the group. She's the tallest of the girls, and prides herself on her intelligence and on seeming mature. She likes horror and fantasy novels, and when you're writing poems, big words that sound sophisticated. Yuri's quietness can make her seem aloof, but it comes from an intense shyness and a severe social anxiety. Yuri can be very obsessive about the things she loves in a way that can be off-putting to people. When she likes something, she will talk your ear off about it in a way friends can find annoying or condescending. I would recommend she start a YouTube channel to mitigate that, it works for me. Her difficulty in reading social interactions, her tendency to come across as condescending without meaning to, her severe social anxiety, and just her introverted nature have all culminated in Yuri being something of a loner who doesn't seem to have many friends outside of the literature club. She's learned from experience that getting close to people annoys them, so her way of dealing with that is to just not get close to anyone. This has led to a lot of self-loathing. She and Natsuki really do not get along. They are opposites in most ways, and often get into fights with each other, but they do ultimately care for each other deeply, even if neither of them can admit it. She also really, really loves knives. Yuri is my favorite of the girls, don't tell Monica. And that brings us to the final character in the game, Sayori. Sayori, the club vice president, is introduced as the player character's lifelong neighbor and friend. She's the girl next door archetype. She's cheerful, clumsy, a bit stupid at times. She's chronically late for school, but she has a good heart. She cares about everyone around her and always wants to brighten everyone else's day. She cares a lot about her friends, and when Yuri and Natsuki get into a fight, she's always there to break it up and remind them that they care for each other. She likes romantic words when you're writing poems, sunset, heart, marriage, but also deeply sad words like tragedy, misery, or scars. This is because Sayori's cheerful exterior and love for her friends is hiding a profound depression that Sayori has been struggling with her entire life. Remember when I said she's chronically late for school? Well, that cute little character trait is revealed later in the game to be because her depression is so severe she often struggles to get out of bed at all. 
The way she makes everyone else's happiness her top priority comes from her wanting to protect everyone else from the pain and sadness she feels every day. You get to read poems from each character several times throughout the game, and in my opinion, the best by far are Sayori's. Not that they're amazing poems in a vacuum, but they communicate so much about who she is. Take for example, Bottles. I pop off my scalp like the lid of a cookie jar. It's the secret place where I keep all my dreams. Little balls of sunshine all rubbing together like a bundle of kittens. I reach inside with my thumb and forefinger and pluck one out. It's warm and tingly. But there's no time to waste. I put it in a bottle to keep it safe. And I put the bottle on the shelf with all of the other bottles. Happy thoughts, happy thoughts, happy thoughts and bottles all in a row. Finally, all done, I open up and in come my friends. In they come in such a hurry. Do they want my bottles that much? I frantically pull them from the shelf, one after the other, holding them out to each and every friend, each and every bottle. That tendency to put her friends first is draining on her, but she feels like she doesn't offer her friends anything else. She performs an exaggerated happiness for fear that her real emotions would drive people away or cause them the same emotional distress and pain she feels. This culminates late in Act 1 in a conversation with Sayori at her house. Her depression has gotten much worse, regardless of the decisions you make in the game, and Sayori finally has a heart-to-heart -heart with the player about it, explaining how hard things are for her for the first time. This scene takes place right before you're supposed to be having a date with either Natsuki or Yuri. The reason this is all hidden from the player character, even though he's known her much longer than any of the other girls in the literature club, is because she's hopelessly in love with him. At the beginning of the game, she strong-arms the player character into joining the club, partially because they need a fifth member to be allowed to continue operations, but really because she wants to find an excuse to spend more time with him. If Doki Doki Literature Club were a different type of game, her route would be the true ending realizing the one you're meant for was the one right in front of you the whole time. It's a classic romantic trope. If you end up romancing Natsuki and Yuri instead of Sayori, you can read the profound hurt behind her words throughout the game when she talks to you about them, knowing that she's the reason the two of you met in the first place. All of this is in Act 1 of Doki Doki Literature Club. The point I'm making is that Doki Doki Literature Club is a good visual novel before the turn, with interesting and fleshed out characters and solid relationships between those characters. These girls don't just stick with people because they're well-designed anime waifus, they stick with people because they're well-designed anime waifus with some real pathos behind them. One thing I really love about this first act is that the depiction of these problems, these struggles the characters are having, is handled with real respect, and they are treated as manageable. Before the game starts being altered at the end of Act 1, Yuri's tendency towards obsession and Natsuki's trauma and Sayori's depression are all things they could work through. Things that, like any mental illness or trauma, will always be a part of them, but don't need to be the things that define any of them. The player character being here is the worst thing that could have happened to any of these girls. The player character sucks. He's generic, there's nothing interesting or compelling about him, and that is absolutely the point. All of these girls are supernaturally pulled into his gravitational orbit in a way that destroys them. What these girls need, especially Sayori, is not generic visual novel protagonist Kuhn, they need to support each other. There's a great scene in Act 2, as Yuri's mental state is unraveling, where Natsuki hands you a poem as usual, and instead, it contains a message that she's deeply worried about Yuri, and that although she doesn't show it, she's always respected Yuri and wanted to become closer friends with her. That feeds back into this, the idea that these girls really complete each other more than the player character ever could. It's not hard to imagine a version of this story where the things about Natsuki and Yuri which contrast each other and cause them to clash, complement each other perfectly instead. 
Regardless of the decisions you make, regardless of whose route you go down, after that scene where Sayori tells you about her battle with depression, and after your date with Yuri or Natsuki, Sayori confesses her love to the player character, and the player is given the choice to tell her that he loves her back, or to tell her that he only sees her as his closest friend. If you tell her you're only friends, she leaves heartbroken. But if you do reciprocate her feelings, the pain is still there. She's still hurting. She still feels pain and emptiness. She got what she wanted, and it didn't magically cure her depression. Because it never does. Sayori's problems are much deeper than pining after someone, and her realization that it's not going to fix her scares her more than ever. I think it's really important that your choice here doesn't matter. It doesn't change anything, because I think it's crucial to the message the first part of the game is trying to convey. Someone telling you they love you is not going to fix that kind of pain. And it's here where the famous Doki Doki turn happens. The next day, you arrive at school and find Sayori absent. Monica says that she already knows what happened yesterday, but you probably shouldn't worry about Sayori too much. Ignoring her advice, you run back to Sayori's house and find that she's hanged herself. She's gone, no matter what you did. It's a graphic and upsetting scene, and it seems so harsh that the game itself starts to break from it. You get an ending card, and the game resets. Act 2 of Doki Doki Literature Club is a slightly abbreviated version of your first playthrough, but one where things have clearly gone wrong. This is where most of the iconic jump scares and creepy imagery from the game come into play. Sayori is suddenly missing from the title screen, replaced with a glitchy composite of the other girls, and when you first start the game, every reference to her is replaced with strings of nonsense and glitched imagery. The game quickly restarts, but now all references to Sayori have been properly purged. You've never known a neighbor you grew up with, you've always been a loner. When you get to school, Sayori doesn't rope you into joining the literature club because she doesn't exist, so your former classmate Monica asks you to join instead. Yuri is now the club vice president. Act 2 of the game plays out very similarly to the first playthrough of the game, but corrupted. There are strange visual errors and some other weird glitches as the game strains to work itself around Sayori's absence. But beyond these technical aspects, things are just wrong without Sayori. Most obviously, something is going very wrong with Yuri. In the first playthrough, Yuri was reserved, quiet, and seemed aloof, but once you got to know her, you got a better understanding of who she was underneath. She's kind of pretentious, and that's me talking, and she has her quirks, but she's not a bad person. She's obsessive, but not... well... In Act 2, Yuri becomes a Nightmare Yandere who will kill anyone who gets between the two of you, whether you're trying to romance her or not. One of the scenes I like in Act 2 is the revised version of the fight between Yuri and Natsuki. In the first playthrough, Yuri says something condescending about Natsuki's poems, and Natsuki fires back by calling her writing convoluted, and saying that she's been stuffing her bra to try to get the player character's attention. You can side with Yuri or side with Natsuki, in which case one of them will feel ganged up on, but the best ending is to ask Sayori for help, in which case she'll step in and defuse the argument. In Act 2, without Sayori's presence there to defuse things, and with emotions of all characters literally dialed up to 11, this argument gets much, much uglier. Natsuki calls Yuri, and I quote, an edgy bitch, and then accuses her of cutting herself, which is true, and Yuri responds by insulting her mental age and saying, what the fuck is wrong with your head? The original playthrough, obviously, didn't have any language like that in it. When you are asked who you side with, the game glitches out repeatedly until Monica appears in front of the UI and pulls you out into the hallway while the two of them have it out. A moment later, Natsuki storms off, and when you return to the classroom, Yuri is saying, I didn't mean it, I didn't mean it, over and over again, rocking back and forth in her chair. She's disturbed by her own behavior. She doesn't know what came over her, and insists she would never act this way. It quickly becomes clear that something is wrong with Yuri. 
The following day, she apologizes to you again for her behavior and reiterates that she's never acted like that before. When Natsuki arrives, she apologizes to her as well, but Natsuki has no idea what she's talking about, saying whatever happened, it must have been something so small she didn't even think about it, which Yuri is blowing out of proportion. Whenever Yuri gets near the player character, things start going very wrong. She tells you her heart is pounding just from getting near to you, and that she needs to calm down after a perfectly normal conversation. Regardless of what poem words you choose and what actions you take, Yuri just gets more and more obsessed with you, eventually forcing you onto her route regardless of if you are going for Natsuki or not. She ends up running to refill a water pitcher while she's cooling down, and when we eventually go after her, we catch her breathing heavily and cutting herself before the game rewinds. Soon, Monica tells you that you need to stay away from Yuri because it's becoming unsafe. She also tells us that Yuri's cutting isn't because of depression, it's a fetish, which tracks with what we see in the game. Even Yuri's behavior in front of the player character quickly becomes disturbing. A little later into the run, we learn that on the first day of the playthrough, she stole one of the protagonist's pens and has been, in her own words, using it to touch herself at night. Her poems are becoming hard to follow strings of consciousness. In her moments of lucidity, she's legitimately scared, saying that her heart can't stop pounding and that she doesn't understand what's happening, saying that she feels like she's losing her mind. The climax of this route comes sooner than the first playthrough, when you have to choose which girl to spend the weekend with. Regardless of what you choose, you end up being railroaded into spending the weekend with Monica this time, which Yuri rejects outright, shouting the other girls out of the classroom. The scene between you and Yuri parallels the scene where Sayori confesses her love to you in the first playthrough, but is much darker and more upsetting. Yuri has completely lost herself in her obsession with you, and she even notes that she knows there's something wrong with her, and that while she was fighting it at first, she can't anymore. She's completely given in to her urges, and she talks about being near you as an addiction a rush, says that she's never felt that good before, and asks if you'll love her in return. Much like Sayori at the end of Act 1, your choice here doesn't matter. Regardless of what you say, Yuri pulls out a knife and in a moment of ecstasy, stabs herself repeatedly and dies. At this point, the game gives up. We're way off script here, and the game puts you in front of Yuri's dead body and forces you to click through strings upon strings of nonsense text. You are sitting there, trapped, through the entire weekend. You can hit skip here, mercifully, if you don't want to spend the time clicking through all the nonsense, but it takes a good long while if you do. Finally, the time comes for Monica and Natsuki to return to the club, and they stumble across what's happened. Natsuki has the reaction you might expect, vomiting and immediately running out of the room, while Monica has a much more muted reaction of, oh, then laughter, and then, well, that's a shame. Yeah, we should talk about Monica. In the first act, Monica doesn't do anything too suspicious. She does have a few lines that are a bit weird in a Metal Gear press the action button kind of way, and she knows things she really shouldn't, like commenting that you left Sayori hanging on the morning she dies. In the second loop, it's a lot easier to catch on to what her deal is. Monica interacts with the game itself several times, appearing in front of the user interface, adding herself into scenes that should have contained Sayori, and forcing you to choose to spend the weekend with her instead of the other two girls through UI manipulation. At one point, famously, the game glitches out, saying, Just Monica, just Monica, just Monica. If you do try to do the Natsuki route during Act 2, you get an extra creepy moment where Natsuki is angry and jealous of how much time you've been spending with Yuri before changing entirely. This monstrous version of Natsuki's neck snaps and she runs towards you. Regardless of what choice you make, when Natsuki writes the letter about her concern for Yuri, the game is once again altered and a faceless version of Natsuki quickly tells you to disregard everything she just said and that you should spend more time with Monica instead, strongly hinting at what exactly is happening here. Monica knows she's in a video game. She knows she's in a visual novel, a dating simulator, an artificial reality. She's the only one who knows this, and she wants you for herself. Not the player character, you. 
the player. To that end, she has been manipulating the game's code and is responsible for the strange things happening in it. Monica wanted to win you over, and so she exaggerated the other girl's most negative qualities. She made Sayori's depression worse towards the end of Act 1, literally edited her code in the files, hoping it would confine her to bed and keep the player away from her, but instead it caused her to confess her love to you and then hang herself. In Act 2, she dialed Yuri's anxiety, her obsessive nature, and her fetish up all the way, hoping you'd see her as a freak and be driven away, but instead, Yuri got so obsessed that she forced you onto her route. Natsuki is the only one who can make it out of this game without having her personality warped, but even if you don't do her route in Act 2, Monica wipes her memory of the fight with Yuri, and if you do her route, she's completely hijacked by Monica in a jump scare. At the end of Act 2, deciding that you're both better off without them, she deletes both Yuri and Natsuki, and the game changes entirely. Act 3 is very different from the first two. Subtlety has not worked for Monica, trying to change things just slightly hasn't done anything, so she's deleted everything in the game except for the classroom, a single desk, and herself. This act plays out over a single screen. Monica explains what went wrong, what's been going on. See, Monica is a character in a dating sim, and all of the girls in this dating sim were programmed to be hopelessly in love with the player. The problem with this is that Monica has no route. She was never designed to be an option for the player to romance. This reveal provides context to the poems she's been showing you throughout the game. Take her first poem, for example, called Hole in the Wall. It couldn't have been me. See the direction the spackle protrudes? A noisy neighbor, an angry boyfriend? I'll never know. I wasn't home. I peer inside for a clue. No. I can't see. I reel, blind, like a film left out in the sun. But it's too late. My retinas. Already scorched with a permanent copy of the meaningless image. It's just a little hole. It wasn't too bright. It was too deep. Stretching forever into everything. A hole of infinite choices. I realize now that I wasn't looking in. I was looking out. And he, on the other side, was looking in. Monica has glimpsed the reality beyond her own, our reality. In a visual novel, in any video game, choices are very limited no matter what the game is. In Doki Doki, you have at most three options at a given time. That is the world Monica knew. She saw through a hole in the wall. When she glimpsed our world, she saw a world of infinite choices, a world more vibrant than she could have ever imagined. Monica loves you because she was created to love you. In the original version of Doki Doki Literature Club, this ending presents you with a choice. In the game's installation folder are specific files representing each girl, labeled sayori.chr, natsuki.chr, yuri.chr, and monica.chr. By the time you reach this conversation with Monica, the other three girls have actually, on your computer, been deleted. There's other stuff going on with file manipulation over the course of the game, it's well documented, I really don't need to go into all of it, but these files are important. In Doki Doki Literature Club Plus, the updated re-release, Monica's endgame is just this. She wants to exist in this place with you, this place outside of time, forever. This is because all of the outside-the-game aspects actually take place in a fake desktop within Doki Doki Literature Club Plus, so you aren't actually manipulating the game's files. In the original, though, she wanted to be with you outside of the game. She asks you to go get a thumb drive, again, in real life, plug it into your computer, and move her onto it. Then she wants you to carry that drive with you forever, so she can be your girlfriend in real life, too. The other option, though knowing where she is on your hard drive, is to delete her. This is, make no mistake, the humane thing to do. Monica has not lived a good life. Upon deleting her, if you launch the game again, you'll get a scene of her being deleted, of reality blinking out of existence. She'll say that she hates you, 
before admitting that even now, as you're killing her, she can't bring herself to stop loving you. It was never her choice, after all. It turns out she didn't delete Sayori or Natsuki or Yuri, she just stored them somewhere. And so, as she is being deleted, she restores them and resets the game. This leads to what is known as Act 4, where you can once again replay the opening of the game, but now Monica is missing. Sayori is the club president, and things mostly play out the same way, until Sayori reveals that, as the club president, she has now gained self-awareness, and thanks you for deleting Monica, saying that now the two of you can be together. Some part of Monica still remains in the game's code, and upon hearing this, and realizing the hellish existence she's now condemned Sayori to, she deletes the whole game, so they can all four find some peace. The end. Monica sings you a song over the credits as the game deletes itself. There is actually a more positive, good ending of DDLC. If you save scum your way through Act 1 and do all of the possible routes before you ever see Sayori's death, then when you reach this moment at the end, Sayori will thank you, not for deleting Monica, but for being the kind of person who really cares about the girls and wanted to help them all. She says they all love you, but that there's nothing else for them to do for you because you've reached the end of the game. This time, as the credits roll, they don't delete themselves, although the game still requires being reset if you want to play it any further. Doki Doki Literature Club is well known as a psychological horror game, but I want to ask where does the horror of Doki Doki Literature Club come from? Is it simply the shock value of seeing self-inflicted graphic violence happen to cute anime waifus? Partially, but I think there's a deeper terror here, which is what actually sticks with people. The terror of losing your self-autonomy. Losing control of who you are, of what you do, and even of how you think. This is a recurring theme of the game, even in those early parts. Saying things you don't mean, snipping at your friends, being unable to get out of bed in the morning, this theme is later built upon by the supernatural, or I guess technological, elements as Monica rewrites the girls to change their behavior. The scariest moments in Doki Doki Literature Club, in my opinion, aren't the ones where Yuri is giving in to her powerful obsession with you, it's those moments of lucidity, where she's fighting the manipulation and saying that she doesn't understand what's happening, doesn't understand her own actions. In this story, there is an outside force causing Yuri this pain, but that's what mental illness feels like. That's what depression and anxiety feel like. Being in a battle with yourself, when you're not even sure how you can win, Feeling empty all the time without knowing why, saying or doing things you don't mean, and feeling like you're not the one piloting yourself. Obsessing over something, being completely incapable of letting it go, and not understanding why. Doki Doki Literature Club is a story about depression and anxiety and mental illness from beginning to end, because what happens to the girls in this game, including Monica, is that same loss of control over your own mind. To underline this, think of Monica's last moments as she's being deleted. First, she says that she hates you, but then admits that even now she can't stop loving you. There's nothing you can do to Monica to change her feelings for you. She is incapable of not loving you, because it's literally programmed into her. That inability to control your own thoughts and feelings is more horrifying than any gory death or jump scare that Doki Doki Literature Club could ever throw at you. Monica might be the antagonist of the game, but she's not a villain. I'm not even convinced that anything she does in this game is ethically wrong, because here's the thing. Within the fiction of Doki Doki Literature Club, Sayori, Yuri, and Natsuki aren't real. They are video game characters. Within the fiction of Doki Doki Literature Club, Monica, however, is real. She is self-aware, she has consciousness, she has sentience, while the others are all just following a script. It could be argued that all of the girls are sentient, especially in Doki Doki Literature Club Plus, which adds some meta-narrative elements. The other three just don't realize they're in a game yet, but I don't think so. 
If you look at the girls.chr files, Monica's is much larger than the other three, and I think that's to indicate she is somehow more than the other girls. If you follow my reading here, then in fiction, Monica manipulating the files of Sayori, Yuri, and Natsuki is no more immoral than a human player drowning some sims in a pool or shooting their way through enemies in Grand Theft Auto. So, I guess what I'm saying is, Monica did literally nothing wrong. Hashtag stop Monica slander. She's as much a victim as the other girls, more so than the other girls, because in fiction, she's the only one who is real. So who is the villain of Doki Doki Literature Club, then? Is it us, the players, who are making these things happen by continuing to play the game? Eh. You can disagree with me here, but I don't really see this as a Spec Ops the Line condemnation of the player type of game, personally. Doki Doki Literature Club isn't anti-dating sim or anti-visual novel, and that's supported by things Salvato has said outside of the game. In a Reddit AMA I came across while doing research for this video, Salvato not only made it very clear that he was a fan of visual novels, but in a question about his feelings on waifu culture, he responds, The power of fictional characters is strong and emotional attachment ultimately leads back to oneself. I feel that people becoming attached to my characters is a compliment, like I've been able to provide them with something that may compel them to become a better person, or just someone that they enjoy being around like a friend. And elsewhere in that thread, when asked whether Monica in fiction really loves you, Salvato says this, if you are the sort of person who strives to be someone deserving of Monica's love, then that's what she loves about you. Only someone who has lost all hope in themselves is the one condemning Monica to her own sad, unfulfilled fantasy. If you believe Monica loves you, then you've found it in you to love yourself a little bit. And that's what she would want more than anything. So, Salvato is clearly not against people growing attached to his characters, nor does he think Monica, the AI, is some sort of evil monster. This isn't a game about how evil players of dating sims are, because in fiction, we the players were ignorant of what we were doing. We didn't know Monica was real when we started to play the game. If anyone can be said to be the villain, then... It's Dan Salvato. That's right, Dan. You hurt my waifus. Now I'm coming for you. It is the situation that is the villain of Doki Doki Literature Club. It is whoever in fiction built this sentient AI just to be the object of desire of players. In Doki Doki Literature Club Plus, there's even a whole meta story with ARG elements you can uncover about a fictional company called Metaverse Enterprise Solutions, which is behind everything, but DDLC Plus and the changes it makes to the meta narrative could be the subject of its own video, so instead I'll just say Dan Salvato. Doki Doki Literature Club, as I see it, is a story about how terrifying it would be to be alive in a constructed reality. To be a person who was created solely to be the plaything of a god. I think it's important to mention the way characters of DDLC are objectified. I'm not just using that term to say that the girls are sexualized, although they definitely are. Their school uniforms are comically tight to show off the girls' figures. Like, they're so tight that they show underboob somehow, and their skirts are absurdly short. I'm not criticizing, I think this is completely justified by the game. The girls in Doki Doki Literature Club are sexualized because they're supposed to be characters in a dating sim. The characters of Doki Doki are literally objectified. They are not people within the fiction, they are objects. While working on this video, I happened to come across Tim Rogers' masterpiece of a review of Tokimeki Memorial, the game that popularized the dating sim genre as we now think of it. I strongly recommend you go watch that video after this one if you haven't seen it. In his review, Rogers reflects on the way playing Tokimeki Memorial to get its true ending requires you to truly objectify the girls in it, to break them down and stop thinking of them as people, but as a list of wants and needs, likes and dislikes. Most of all, it requires you to objectify Shiori Fujisaki, the canonical love interest and the hardest girl of all to romance. Rogers writes, 
And when we decide we now finally know enough to romance her, we, by necessity, objectify her with a Swiss watchmaker's attention to detail. When we romance Shiori Fujisaki, our erstwhile whimsical return to high school acquires the cold fatalism of factory work. How terrifying it must be to be the focus of that attention to detail. To be the subject of that cold, meticulous approach to love. That is the story of Doki Doki Literature Club. It is a story about the existential horror of being created solely for the purpose of being the object of desire of someone else. What is Monica if not Pygmalion's sculpture? The perfect waifu, one which can love you back. A face which anime fans and visual novel fans and dating sim fans have collectively sculpted and idealized and perfected and are now praying to Aphrodite to bring to life. Doki Doki Literature Club is the story of Pygmalion, but that is only a love story from Pygmalion's perspective. To the statue, it is a horror story. That brings us to the second game we'll be talking about today, Slay the Princess. Slay the Princess was released on October 23rd, 2023. It is a visual novel released by Black Tabby Games, who are also known for their ongoing episodic visual novel, Scarlet Hollow. Black Tabby Games was founded by a married couple, Abby Howard and Tony Howard Arias. Black Tabby's site is very clear about the division of labor here, which is helpful if you're writing a YouTube video essay about their games. Abby is the sole artist on the games, Tony codes them, and they write the scripts together. The setup for Slay the Princess is simple. You are on a path in the woods, and at the end of that path is a cabin, and in the basement of that cabin is a princess. You are here to slay her. If you don't, it will be the end of the world. Or, at least, that's what the narrator you can hear and talk to says. You have been dropped in media res, and have no actual obligation to listen to what the narrator is telling you, nor any of the other voices in your head that quickly appear to start advising you on what to do. When you make it to the cabin, you find out that there is indeed a princess, and whatever you do, whatever choices you make, eventually you find that everything has reset. You're back at the beginning, on a path in the woods. Your actions in that first loop had consequences, though, and when you reach the princess again, you will find her changed. You will find the cabin changed. She remembers what you did last time. And then, you do it all again. And again and again. There are some generalities I want to talk about at the top here about how the game gets pretty much everything right. I want to praise the game's cast here, which is made up of an entire two people. Jonathan Sims plays the narrator and the many voices in your head, while Nicole Goodnight plays the many different iterations of The Princess. Both of these actors are primarily known for their work on fiction podcasts, with Jonathan Sims being best known for The Magnus Archives, which I hadn't heard of until my audience started recommending it to me, and now I'm like a hundred episodes in, it's really good, and Nicole Goodnight seems to be mostly known for her work on over 150 episodes of the No Sleep podcast. Podcast, which I have listened to a lot of over the years, and has popped up briefly on podcasts like The Leviathan Chronicles? Oh my god, I haven't thought about The Leviathan Chronicles since like 2010. Both Sims and Goodnight bring their A-game to the performances here, and are a large part of what makes this game so memorable. I think it was pretty smart to go to the realm of podcasts for the casting in this game, because both the Magnus Archives and the No Sleep podcast are anthology shows, with the Magnus Archives featuring a larger narrative about a fictionalized version of Sims reading statements on the paranormal given to a research institute over the course of decades, and the No Sleep podcast being, well, a collection of stories from the No Sleep subreddit. Because of this, both actors have experience giving a wide range of performances and narration as different characters, which is essential here. Sims not only has to voice the narrator, but 11 different voices that start to advise the player based on their actions. Don't forget what he did to us the last time around. I wouldn't trust a word out of his mouth. 
There's got to be a way out of here, for us and for the princess. We just have to keep trying. I'm inclined to agree. If he doesn't remember what happened last time, maybe it's best to keep it that way. You know I can hear you two, right? It's going to be a lot harder than you think to keep secrets from me. Each of these voices needs to be a distinct performance, indicating a distinct personality. Meanwhile, Goodnight has to voice 20 different versions of the princess, all of which need their own distinct performances. I'm free, and you're not trying to kill me this time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, your intentions. You have a knife. What are you going to do with it? Why are you here? The little bird has returned to me. I wonder what he wants. This is not an easy thing to do. That many different performances that simultaneously have to read as the same person, that's a tough job, but I think both Sims and Goodnight knocked it out of the park here. If the actors weren't able to sell this, the game would fall apart. But they are, so it all holds together beautifully. The art of Slay the Princess is utterly phenomenal. Abby Howard's art in this game is just enchanting. Every screen is an utter joy to look at. The game is presented in three colors, black, white, and occasionally red. The art of Slay the Princess is at times breathtaking and at times repulsive. Fans of degloving, have I got a game for you. The music is also a standout, composed by Brandon Boone, who has also worked on Scarlet Hollow, the No Sleep podcast, and other various mostly horror-themed works. Like the performances, the music has to strike a lot of different tones, from horror to fairy tale, and I think it nails all of them. The writing is, of course, excellent. It's a visual novel, so we wouldn't be here if it wasn't. We'll talk about the story and the larger picture throughout the rest of this video, but I want to call out how sharp the dialogue is. There is a beauty to the language used. It's also, I want to make clear, a very funny game. There are so many laugh out loud moments in the script, usually lines given to Sims or just absurd actions you can take. You take the blade from the table. It would be difficult to slay the princess and save the world without a weapon. Okay, fine, you took the knife. But you really shouldn't hold it like that. Then how are we supposed to hold it? The other way, thumb at the bottom. It'll look much cooler and more serious if we hold it with our thumb at the bottom. You switch your grip on the blade. Congratulations. Yes! Isn't this so much better? <sighs> okay, fine. You're right. This does look a lot better. It really doesn't matter. Just get on with it and deal with the princess already. Ha <laughs> ha! Yes! Do it! Seriously. Ugh, you throw the blade at the window, glass showering the cabin as your weapon flies out into the night. I suppose you'll just have to deal with the princess without it. It's also, though, not funny at the cost of the narrative being less impactful. It walks the line carefully of being hilarious while still making sure you can take the game overall seriously. It's funny without ever indulging in bathos, that sort of winking at the camera anticlimax as comedy that really sucks the air out of a narrative. The game which the comedy in this reminds me of, and how well it manages to have hilarious moments without draining the dramatic tension of the story overall, is Disco Elysium. Like Slay the Princess, Disco Elysium is a very funny game, but it knows when to take itself seriously. And really, if I'm comparing Slay the Princess to Disco Elysium, one of the best games ever made, that should tell you everything you need to know. When it wants to, Slay the Princess can be incredibly unnerving, and once again, that often comes down to Sim's impeccable performance. It's as if every part of your being is coming to a lurching halt. Heart. Lungs. Liver. Nerves. Heart. Lungs. Liver. Nerves. Your lungs pull in a desperate gulp of air as your eyes shoot back open. All of these elements, the art, the performances, the music, the dialogue, come together to create one of the most perfect games I've ever played. 
there is almost no fat on this game. Nothing that truly doesn't work. All of the routes you can see are phenomenal and stick with you. All of the endings are interesting and satisfying. In some total, there is something hypnotic about Black Tabby's games, both of them. And I think everyone should play Slay the Princess, whether they like visual novels or not. I realized while working on this script that Slay the Princess is my favorite visual novel. I haven't played every visual novel, of course, but of the ones I've played, I think Slay the Princess is the absolute best of the best, and it's not even particularly close. Part of the reason I want to talk about it alongside Doki Doki Literature Club is because, like DDLC, it is a meta-narrative, but also because I think it makes a good contrast with DDLC because of what it does better than that game. Maybe better than any game I've ever played. Interaction and reactivity. For all of the praise I have for Doki Doki Literature Club, it is, like most visual novels I've played, a relatively passive experience. I like visual novels. I do not claim to be an expert on the genre, and there are certainly people watching this video who have played a lot more of them than I have, but I've played my fair share of them. In my experience, a typical visual novel involves a lot of reading peppered with a few key decision points throughout that determine how the story unfolds. They are a logical extension of those choose-your-own-adventure books you would see as a kid, but with greater ambition and convenience. A criticism of the genre, which I think is sometimes fair, is that many visual novels often fail to use the special quality of interactive fiction to their advantage, the interactivity. This is why there's even a debate that has been raging for as long as I can remember over whether or not visual novels are even games in the first place, or just interactive fiction, or if there's even a difference between those ideas. That debate could be the topic for its own video, but in short, I think that visual novels are games as long as they react to the player and require the player to make decisions. Story can be gameplay when the player is shaping the story. Mass Effect's story is gameplay. Uncharted's story is not. Doki Doki Literature Club is, in my opinion, a game because the player's input shapes the course of the game. Not the end point, but the journey you take to get there, certainly. Whether you pursue Sayori, Yuri, or Natsuki in the first act, or Yuri or Natsuki in the second act, these do change what you see and what happens over the course of the game. In short, Doki Doki Literature Club is a game because it relies on player interaction. The density of interaction, however, is very low. Those key choices are often very far apart, with minutes and minutes of clicking and reading between the player actually interacting with the game directly at all. Slay the Princess's trick is that everything is a key decision point. That density of interaction is almost impossibly high. There aren't two or three key moments. Every screen, every conversation, of which there are many, determines your path through the game. As an example of this, let me walk you through just a few of the ways your interaction with the princess in Chapter 1 can branch. Let's narrow this down to a specific case. Let's say you find yourself in the cabin, and you decide you're going to slay the princess before going into the basement, taking the pristine blade along with you. The first way this can play out is the simplest. You walk down into the basement where the princess is chained, and you immediately rush her, disregarding anything she says to you, and drive the blade through her heart. You will run her through and successfully slay her. Upon slaying her, you'll find that the narrator has trapped you in the cabin for all eternity, and the only way to escape is to use the blade on yourself. Doing so will lead to a second chapter where you encounter a version of the princess called the Spectre. But let's say you hesitated. Let's say you go down into the basement, still with the knife, but listen to her, even just for a moment. Ask her name, ask why she's down there, anything. Now, when you rush her, she'll have prepared and will counterattack. If you fight her and win, you will end up on a completely different chapter 2 called The Adversary. If you fight her and lose, you will end up on yet another completely different chapter called The Tower. While you're talking to her, though, the narrator will assure you that the princess is unarmed and defenseless. 
if you pick the option to wonder for a moment whether she's really unarmed, then when you do attack her, you'll find that she was hiding a knife of her own somewhere, which ultimately leads to a completely different fight scene, and when you lose, yet another version of Chapter 2, The Razor. But now, let's go back to that first decision. Let's say you walked up and slayed the princess without hesitation, but then listened to her dying words, saying that it wouldn't be enough to stop her. Well, if you do listen, if you doubt yourself and the narrator, then it turns out the princess wasn't dead, and just like when you doubted him telling you she was unarmed, she'll get the better of you, which is an alternate way to reach the Razor version of Chapter 2. That's already a lot of branching, and that's all confined to the very specific parameters I mentioned above, that you take the knife with you, and you do slay her. Other routes, other sets of branches exist for not bringing the knife and for not slaying her at all, or bringing the knife and not slaying her, or not bringing the knife but deciding to slay her after all, or even for leaving without ever visiting the cabin in the first place. But that's not all. Based on the decisions you make within those routes, not only can each of those Chapter 2 versions of the princess be the end of that route, but they can further change into Chapter 3 variants. The Spectre can become the Wraith, the Adversary can become the Eye of the Needle or the Fury, the Razor can lead to variant Chapter 3s called No Way Out or the Arms Race, and even to a Chapter 4 called Mutually Assured Destruction. The Tower can lead to the Fury, like the Adversary can, or to her own unique variant called the Apotheosis. And each of those chapters have their own branches and different outcomes that can happen within the chapters themselves. All of those decisions that could eventually lead to all of these possible outcomes happen within the span of a few minutes, without the player on their first run through the game necessarily even realizing they're making decisions at all. It's a simple trick on paper, but the effect it has on making Slay the Princess feel so easy to get into is massive. Unlike, for example, DDLC, there is never a long stretch of passive time between gameplay moments, times where you're just reading. There's never more than a few lines of dialogue between you actively engaging with the game. It just makes the game go down so smooth. It's a pleasure to play, and it never feels like it's dragging or wasting your time, even in spite of the repetitive nature of the story. It's why, in my opinion, Slay the Princess is a visual novel that even those who don't like visual novels should play. This is actually the second time I've talked about Slay the Princess on this channel. Back in mid-2023, I gave my impressions of a demo for the game released for Steam's Ludo Naricon event. At the time, I was skeptical that the game would actually be able to keep this level of reactivity up with a longer runtime. But, to my amazement, they actually did. The game never runs out of steam and never starts to trip over itself because of its complexity. The way the game pulls this trick off without the wheels coming off of the whole thing because of complexity is that the game never has to deal with the branching actually getting out of hand because the structure of the game is that of nested loops. On a base level, you have the loops of Chapter 1, Chapter 2, and potentially Chapters 3 and 4. These serve as action and reaction. In the first chapter, the game is reading your actions, and in the second chapter and beyond, it's giving you the consequences of those actions. Each chapter is a short loop that takes maybe 10 to 20 minutes on average. These chapters together make what I'm referring to as a route. Going from the base chapter 1 into the tower version of chapter 2 into the apotheosis version of chapter 3 collectively form a single route. At the end of each of these routes, you have an encounter with a powerful presence we'll talk about later called the Shifting Mound, who wants you to bring as many different variants of the princess as possible to her, which she refers to as vessels, and who then resets you not just to the beginning of a chapter, but to the beginning of an entire route. So, the game doesn't have to worry about a decision you made in the first five minutes two hours later, because two hours later you'll be on a second or third route. The reset button will be hit without it feeling cheap, or like you've been cheated out of seeing the consequences of your actions. 
A full playthrough of the game requires you to finish a total of five routes. So replaying the game to poke at it and see what differences you can make happen, a common experience in any game with multiple routes, is built into the game itself. I've played through the whole game five times now, 25 routes, and according to Steam achievements, I've only seen about 60% of the game, so it manages to have a tremendous amount of replayability, which adds yet another meta level of looping repetition to the whole game. If there's a single word which I think sums up Slay the Princess, then it is reactive. The game reacts to the player constantly, in a way that feels like the game is actually playing off of you and not just going through a set of scripted actions. Almost like you're playing a tabletop game with a game master reacting to you in real time. That reactivity is essential to Slay the Princess, not only because it makes it so engaging, but because the story itself is about that reactivity. It's here where we need to actually talk about the story this game is telling. This is going to get very big and abstract, so try to stay with me. You may have noticed that I said fundamental facts about the princess, like whether she's armed or unarmed, change based on the player's actions. Or to be more precise, based on the player's perception of her. As I said before, at the end of each route you encounter a powerful presence called the Shifting Mound, who absorbs whichever version of the princess you've encountered on that route. The Shifting Mound is the princess, the aggregation of all of the princesses. Each princess is an aspect of her, and she is the sum total of everything the princess can be. At the end of the game, you come face to face with the narrator, speaking to you in the form of your own reflection, who explains what the Shifting Mound is, and perhaps more importantly, what you are. The narrator describes himself as someone who was once painfully mortal. He lived in the dying days of his world, and describes the universe as being on its last gasps of breath. This story is set in the moments before the death of the universe, at least according to the narrator. Somehow, it doesn't really matter how, the narrator was able to grasp the concept of life and death and rend it into two. These two halves are the shifting mound that is the princess and the long quiet that is the player. The problem is, the concept of life and death does not exist in a vacuum. The Shifting Mound is not death, but she contains death within her multitudes. The Long Quiet is not life, but he contains life within himself. That sounds a little bit hard to grasp, so to speak more practically, the princess is a god of change, a god of possibility, while the player is a god of stasis. It might be more accurate to call them concepts rather than gods, but the distinction is subtle at best. By extension, the princess is a god of death, while the player is a god of life. These two things were one. They contain each other within themselves. In dying, we experience the ultimate state of stasis, of oblivion, while at the same time, we undergo the ultimate change, from the state of life to the state of death. Our bodies change, they become something else. The dirt below, that changes once again into new life. These two concepts are at odds with each other, eternally fighting, yet they are paradoxically the same. Each is defined by the other. How can life exist in the absence of death? As the Shifting Mound says in one of the in-between segments, nothing is defined by the absence of something, and so on its own, nothing cannot exist. Change is defined by the absence of stasis, and stasis is defined by the absence of change. You might notice that talking about Slay the Princess literally sounds like talking about it symbolically, and talking about Slay the Princess symbolically sounds like talking about it literally. I'm sorry, it's just that kind of game. The narrator died in the process of separating the two of you, and in doing so, became an echo. All of the narrators you meet in all of the different routes are different aspects of the original. By virtue of being the concept of change, the princess changes into whatever she is perceived to be. 
That is why your thoughts change reality. If you second guess yourself that the princess might be armed, then she is armed. And if you don't, then she never was. The reason the narrator split the two of you is because he wanted to bring an end to death. He created a construct, everything we see in the game, the cabin, the woods, all of it, and placed the two of you within it. The princess is what you believe her to be, and therefore, if you believe you can slay her, you can slay her. Every time you end a route, the construct boots the two of your consciousnesses over to another reality, another version of the cabin and the woods, so that you may slay her there too. The narrator needs you to slay all the forms of the shifting mound, slay all the infinite multitudes of the princess within her. But again, if you believe you can do this, you can do this. The narrator insists that in any loop where you don't slay the princess, you're damning an entire universe to destruction, but I think this is misleading. By necessity, there cannot be anyone but you and the princess in the construct, or else another person's perception of her would interfere with what he's trying to make you do. If you don't slay the princess, slay the shifting mound, kill the concept of change itself, then it will be the end of the world, but I don't think it will be an immediate end. I think the world will just keep on turning, and turning, and turning. And eventually, because the concept of change exists, the world will end. Maybe tomorrow, maybe a billion years from now. Eventually, the heat death of the universe will come. One of the voices can even press the narrator on what exactly the end of the world means, and if there's anything that comes after it, to which the narrator says that he doesn't know. The end of the world means the end of the world, so he can't exactly jump over to the other side to see what lies there. That possibility of a future after the end of the world, of something after the heat death of the universe is important, because within the framework of this game, it would have to be true. As long as the shifting mound exists, change exists, and so the heat death of the universe will eventually give rise to something else. Another Big Bang, another universe, another heat death. The in-between segments where you speak to the shifting mound are where this construct is starting to fail. Interestingly, the game always says that you find yourself in the long quiet. This dark, silent realm you end up in between routes is you. Everything here is you, except for the things that are the princess. Whenever you approach the Shifting Mound, the game says you are approaching a cabin, and I think that's because while the princess is the Shifting Mound, so is the cabin, so are the woods, and so is the basement. Anything in the game which can change is a part of the Shifting Mound. I think this is why there's always a second broken chain in the basement. I think this is to symbolize how you and the princess were once the same. You were both the basement, you were both the cabin, you were both the princess, but the narrator tore you apart, broke that connection. It is a visualization of the tear, as you were broken from the cabin, the woods, and the princess. And this is really the problem with the narrator's plan. He insists the tear is rough, that some aspect of the princess still remains within you, and that some aspect of you exists within the princess, but we see what the long quiet looks like, that infinite inky abyss, and I think it's fair to assume that a world where the concept of change had been killed would look much like this long quiet, and really, how different from Oblivion is that abyss? The game opens with the phrase, this is a love story. It is a love story between the shifting mound and the long quiet, between change and stasis. You are both abstract concepts, at odds with each other, but never without the other. For all of that big picture, the massive god-scale conflict going on, my favorite part of this is the intimate, personal story between the player and the princess. The princess is, after all, literally your other half. There is a reading of this game that's about abusive relationships, mutually abusive relationships, and I don't think that reading is wrong. I think Slay the Princess is a big and complex enough narrative to support multiple interpretations. In my eyes, though, the true villain of this story is not any of the princesses, and it's not the Shifting Mound, and it's not the player, 
It is the narrator. The narrator feared death and so split the two of you and created a situation where the two of you, meant to be together, would be forced to hurt each other eternally. One of my favorite routes in the game is the thorn. In order to get the thorn, you have to first betray the princess. You have to agree to let her free, then stab her in the back when you get a chance. Then you have to be hurt by the princess, dying to her when she fights back. This leads to the second chapter, The Witch, where the version of the princess you find is paranoid, violent, and ready to kill you. If you continue to fight against the witch, you'll end up getting the third chapter, The Wild, when the two of you end up killing each other, but you also have the option of telling the witch that you don't want to fight anymore. That the two of you have been forced to hurt each other, and that the only way you'll get out of this situation is if one of you chooses to rise against it. In a show of goodwill, you can hand the pristine blade over to the witch. She will then say it's a trick and stab you to death with it. In your final moments, before everything goes dark, she'll look confused. She'll ask why you would give her the knife, why you would trust her, why you would let her hurt you. This leads to Chapter 3, The Thorn. The Thorn Route is a visualization of the story of two people destined to hurt each other, forced to hurt each other and themselves by the nature of their situation. It is a microcosm of the entire game, about these two people rising above their situation, and can be about them breaking that cycle together. The thorn version of the princess finds herself trapped in a thicket of thorns. She cannot move without hurting herself. You can abandon her, or you can wind up trapped with her, as you already are in the construct itself. But the version of this route I really like is the one where the two of you learn to trust each other. The Thorn still has the pristine blade from your second time through with the Witch, and she still finds herself confused and paranoid about your intentions. You can convince her, though. You can tell her you want to free her, but that you can only do so if she trusts you and gives you the blade. She does, and you can cut her free. Depending on your choices in Chapter 2, you can even end up here with the voice of the smitten and can choose to kiss her once she's been freed. You lean in and you kiss her. And... And she reciprocates enthusiastically. You kiss. It's done. Are you happy now? Together, over the narrator's protesting, the two of you can rise above the situation and walk out of the cabin hand in hand. This isn't an ending to the game, it is only an ending to a route, but it feels incredibly satisfying, and it sets up several of the proper endings thematically. And now, I want to talk about those possible endings of the game. There are quite a few of them, and there are no good and bad endings. The game tells you as much at the beginning when you launch it. All endings are valid. Okay, maybe not all of them. First, there's a joke good ending if you walk into the cabin, slay the princess immediately, go back upstairs, and do as the narrator tells you to, and just wait out eternity. I don't consider this to be a real ending, but it's worth mentioning here. Next, there's another hidden ending, what I think of as the inaction ending, if you never bring the shifting mound a single vessel. Every time you hit chapter 2, leave, and repeatedly refuse to enter the cabin. Without being given a single form to cling to, the Shifting Mound will be described as explicitly going through the five stages of grief. Denying what you're doing, being furious at you, pleading with you to bring her something, falling into a deep depression, and finally accepting what you've done. Together, the two of you both fade into nothingness. This ending is interesting, and there's a beauty to the two of you both fading into oblivion together, with the Shifting Mound forgiving you for all you've done to her, but this is, I think undeniably, the worst ending, not only for the characters, but the world at large. Since both you and the Shifting Mound are condemned to oblivion because of your inaction, the universe is denied both aspects of change and of stasis. It is a world that cannot exist, as nothing can change, but paradoxically, nothing can stay the same. And so there is nothing. 
There's not even nothing, because as the Shifting Mound says, nothing can only be defined as the absence of something, which means we can't even really conceptualize what this world would be like. This brings us to the proper not-hidden endings, which occur when you bring a fifth vessel to the Shifting Mound. The Shifting Mound will send each vessel you've faced to try to convince you not to slay her as the narrator wanted, but rather to leave the construct with her, and rule over the universe as gods of change and stasis, of death and life, together. She will present you with the perspectives you have brought to her, in order to try to convince you of why a world without death would be meaningless, and you can address each vessel's perspective directly, or rebuke her. You can argue with her from the perspective of humanity on a practical level, or you can rise to her level and argue as two gods. The first of these proper endings is to accept her offer. You won't be literally merged into the same concept again, but together, the universe can continue on as it always had. Things will change, things will stay the same, and things will change again, until eventually the universe burns itself out. This is not a bad ending in my eyes. Yes, the universe will one day burn out, but that's the way it's meant to be. The narrator would argue against this, argue that anything is better than oblivion, but is that true? Is the world the narrator sought to create, one without death, but by extension one of eternal silence and stillness, worth anything? I wouldn't want to live there. By contrast, there's the ending where you resist the Shifting Mound and choose to finally slay the princess. At the end of your conversation with the Shifting Mound, if you reject her offer, the voice of the hero reappears and says he can take you to her heart because of that rough tear, because of that connection. He can take you to the part of you within her which takes the form of one final cabin. Within that final cabin, you meet the very first version of the princess you encountered. There's only three versions of the princess this can be. The sweet and gentle version if you descended into the basement without the knife, the more cold and callous version if you did take the knife, or the merged multitudes that are the stranger if you refused to ever enter the cabin on your very first loop of the playthrough. Technically, that means all of the remaining endings have three different variations based on which princess you encounter, but they all more or less play out the same way. If you have decided that the Shifting Mound must be killed, that the narrator was right, and that whatever comes next must be better than Oblivion, you can take the blade, descend into the basement, and slay the princess one last time. This gives the ending referred to as A New Dawn. You see what lies beyond the construct, and give birth to a new universe, an unending universe, symbolized by an eternally burning star. There are no right or wrong endings of Slay the Princess, but this is, in my opinion, the worst outcome of the non-hidden primary endings. This ending also has a variant, the Everyone Hates You ending, where you've wronged all of the voices in your head and are stuck with them for eternity. I haven't actually gotten that ending, so I'm just talking about the main version here. The idea of a world without change being created is, I think, hard to fathom. On a more character-focused level, though, this ending is a bad outcome for our main character. It is, in my opinion, the wrong choice. The Long Quiet and the Shifting Mound were once the same concept. And so, this ending, to me, is about moving forward having lost an important piece of yourself along the way. It is the worst ending for the Long Quiet's arc. That's not to say the ending is bad in that I don't like it, though. I think it's a beautifully written, tragic ending. It was, actually, the first ending I got for the game, and once I'd had time to chew on it, it left me with a lot to think about. If you take the blade with you into that final basement, you don't necessarily have to slay the princess, though. She will ask you to sit with her and have one last conversation instead. In this conversation, you can second-guess yourself, say that you don't want to be a god, and she'll admit that she doesn't either. You can say you are much more set on slaying the her out there, the shifting mound, than the woman sitting in front of you. It's easier to kill a concept than a person. She will propose another solution. No solution at all. 
She can do anything you believe she can do. And so, if you believe it, she could reset the entire game back to the beginning. Wipe both of your memories and let everything happen again. You can point out that you'll just end up here again eventually, and she says, yes, but there's nothing stopping you from resetting things again, and again, and again, for all of eternity. In fact, she points out, in all probability, it would make sense if this wasn't the first time you've been here, making this choice. If things change and you decide to kill her or leave with her, then let that happen, but let it be another version of you that makes that decision, not the one here and now. If you agree to her plan, she'll take the knife and stab you, and then everything resets like it has so many times before. You're on a path in the woods. At the end of that path, there is a cabin. In the basement of that cabin, there is a princess. You're here to slay her. If you don't, it will be the end of the world. This ending isn't an ending. I mean, you get credits, but all it does is kick the problem a little further down the road. Then again, maybe once you get there, the two of you really can just keep kicking it further down the road forever. This decision is one of trust. The two of you trusting not just the versions of you that exist here and now, but the versions that will always exist forever. That there is something innate in you that will keep this loop going for eternity. Is this loop truly a circle, or is it a spiral? You have no way of knowing. That just leaves one major ending. My favorite ending. When you get to the final cabin, leave the knife. Throw it out the window if you can. Go down into that final basement unarmed and talk. You don't want to be the long quiet, and the princess, each of them, don't want to be the shifting mound. While all of them together are a god, each of them individually are victims of their greater whole. So, you suggest that the two of you simply leave. Leave the whole thing. Leave godhood, leave the long quiet, leave the shifting mound, and just live. This was especially appropriate because the first time I found this ending, I happened to have met the stranger as my first version of the princess, so she was the one I left with. The stranger in the end feels like a more human version of the Shifting Mound. She still contains her multitudes. It is the version of her that contains all of her, but without the pretense of godhood. You can call the Shifting Mound out on her pretense, on the way she speaks in riddles, earlier at the end of one of the routes. Everything she says is said with cosmic importance, and you can tell her in your final conversation to come down to the level of humanity. But that's not what she wants. She wants to bring you up to the level of godhood. The difference between this ending and the version where you leave with the Shifting Mound is that you are leaving godhood behind. This is the thorn ending, but without being cut short by the shifting mound taking her. You both reject divinity and go together to live in love. There is a sense, to me at least, that this is the best ending for the characters, that this is truly the two of them leaving this painful situation that's not working behind and finding something new together. The princess tells you that she doesn't know if that's possible, or what that would mean. That she doesn't know what lies beyond the cabin door, or if there is anything beyond that cabin door. The moment the cabin door opens, the game ends, without you ever seeing what lies beyond for our characters. The reason for this, I think, is because in this ending, the long quiet and the princess aren't just leaving the construct to enter the universe beyond it, they're leaving the game. Anything that Slay the Princess could show you beyond that door would not be an ending. They wouldn't have left because it would still be part of the game. The achievement for getting this ending is called, And What Happens Next? And the description is, whatever it is, you'll face it together. It is a love story, after all. My interpretation of that last ending got pretty meta, and that's because, as I said before, Slay the Princess is a meta-narrative. The key difference between Slay the Princess and Doki Doki Literature Club is that the meta-elements are not so forward-facing that you need to engage with them. 
you can play Slay the Princess without thinking about the meta aspects of it just fine, but if you made it to the end of DDLC without thinking about the parts where it is a game, I don't think you've actually played DDLC. Where Doki Doki is a story about a character trapped in a game, I view Slay the Princess as a story about a character trapped in a story. Much like Monica, the princess and by extension the Shifting Mound suffer because they are constrained to the limited parameters of a fictional narrative. When you write a story, you begin with everything. An empty page. Infinite possibilities. Writing a story is the process of whittling down everything into something, constraining that infinity of what could happen within the finite bounds of what does happen. This is what the narrator is doing to the princess. This is what you are doing to the princess by perceiving her. What is the princess? Which princess is the true princess? Is she the sweet-natured damsel or the vicious razor? Is she the dominant tower or the broken thorn? She's all of these things, and by giving you a single path in the woods, the narrator has pressed her multitudes into a single form, one that always erupts out of its prison in the end. When you ask the Shifting Mound what she is, she tells you, We are oceans reduced to shallow creeks. This is a perfect way to describe how these two characters are concepts, a web of related concepts squeezed into the sausage casings of skin and flesh that are the characters in the game. You are like me, even if you have chosen not to look at the corners of you that do not fit, even if you have chosen to ignore the brilliant contours of your soul. It's also a beautiful way of symbolizing the idea of characters. It doesn't matter how well sketched the characters in a game or anything else are, they are essentially less realized than a person, empty echoes of life. This is not a pipe, after all and they are fictional characters. It is only through the treachery of gameplay that they appear to act at all. Every time you reach chapter two, you find a mirror in the cabin, one which, for some reason, the narrator insists isn't there. Every time you try to wipe the mirror clean to see your reflection, it vanishes. On one level, the mirror does represent how the shifting mound and the long quiet mirror each other. But I think there's another meta reading to it which works as well. At the end of the game, the Shifting Mound accuses you of always reacting and never acting. Saying that it is your nature, which is ironic since the truth, is actually the complete opposite. You are the one always acting and the game can only ever react. Every time the princess changes and the world changes with her, it is because of an action that the player has taken. The world cannot act without the player, because the game cannot function without the player. This is what games do fundamentally. They reflect your actions back at you. The princess might be sweet and gentle or cold and calculating, but only because you've taken the knife or left it upstairs. A boss in Dark Souls might kill you, but the boss fight cannot begin until you walk through the fog wall. Karlak might decide to leave your party, but only because you did something truly terrible in the Druid Grove. Always reacting, and never acting. This is how I read the mirror. You see the mirror at the end of each route, just before you encounter the Shifting Mound, and get a glimpse of what you look like. The first time you see it, the game says, it's you. The voices are you, the world is you, and the princess is you. The game cannot actually respond to you. It cannot understand you, it can only reflect your decisions back at you. It is far more elegant, but ultimately no different from the mirroring of Eliza all the way back in 1966. In that sense, the game is you. On some level, every interaction you can have in a video game is this same mirroring, action and reaction. Whenever you reach a chapter 3, the mirror has moved directly in your path. The more actions you take, the more clearly the game is able to reflect your decisions. The narrator denying that the mirror exists is much like games trying to trick you into thinking that they're doing anything but reacting to your effect on the world. 
At the end of each route, every time you look in the mirror, you've changed. And I think that's important too. While games might be a reflection of the player, the player takes something of the game with them too. Like all art, the viewer is reshaped by it. That can be a negative reaction of really, really hating the art, or a positive reaction where it sits with you for a long time. Unlike other mediums, the strength of games is that both sides have changed. When you consider the art, the art itself changes. Action and reaction, action and reaction. We have all become Pygmalion in our own way. We find comfort in our digital friendships and loves, and the characters we take with us after each game is over. I may not understand the appeal of apps like Replica, but I romanced Shadowheart in Baldur's Gate 3 when given the chance. I may not like using Siri or Alexa, but Garrus Vakarian is my best space friend, so who am I to judge? I think, in a way, this is natural and powerful. It is human nature to project feelings and thoughts onto things that we know don't actually have them. That can be exploited for a profit, but it can also be used by art to elicit an emotional response, and to make us consider things about ourselves. Which girl is your favorite in Doki Doki Literature Club, or which princess is your favorite in Slay the Princess, says something about you. It is a reflection of who you consider yourself to be. Reflection is, I think, the key word. Tokimeki Memorial, Doki Doki Literature Club, Slay the Princess. At the end of the day, all these characters can do, their entire worlds, revolve around the player. The achievement for listening to Monica for a long time in Doki Doki Literature Club is called simply, She Will Never Be Real. None of them will be. None of the characters in games can ever be real, no matter how much you love Monica, or the Princess, or Shadowheart, or Astarian, or Tally, or Anders, or any other character in any other game you've ever loved. They are all just Eliza at the end of the day, reflecting your own actions back at you. But is that a bad thing? As Dan Salvato said when asked if Monica really loved the player, if games are reflections of ourselves, then if we believe a character in a game can love us, that means we have found it within to love ourselves, and let the world be just a bit softer for a moment. After all, there is nothing on the other side of the screen. It is an illusion, a magician's trick, to make a mirror look like a window. If you're still here, then from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for watching. I've been working on this video off and on for the better part of a year at this point, so it means a lot to me that you've made it this far. If you're new to the channel and you liked this video, go check out my video from last Halloween about the games of indie horror auteur Kira. I think there's a pretty good chance this video ends up demonetized, so if you liked this video, please consider giving to my Patreon or joining as a YouTube channel member. There's a companion video to this one available for supporters at $5 and above on both platforms, which looks at the four currently available episodes of Black Tabby's other game, Scarlet Hollow. Scarlet Hollow is, like Slay the Princess, something really special, so if you want to turn this double feature into a triple feature, hey, head over to patreon.com slash Zuldim, or join as a channel member down below. I'd appreciate the support. Special thank you to... Strix2031, Mikaru X, Unhealthy Caillou, Sean Kolb, Sir Darkon, Rachel Aurelia, Frondi, Yo Yo Jojo Mojo, Nathan Heal, Sai Voafehi, Dan Luther, Lucky Tiger, Still Just Cow, Jose Armalas, William, Cabbage, Rekka, Alex Smith, Picayune, Alex Stewart, Hakan Boyum, Pete Lee, Nittend, Shiny Empty Head, That's All, Alex, Bell Mage, and Malachi Murphy. I'd also like to thank Tiger Red TV for the art seen in the thumbnail for this video. 
It's worth mentioning that there is an update coming to Slay the Princess soon called The Pristine Cut that is adding more content to the game. I considered waiting to make this video until The Pristine Cut was out, but I decided that there was already enough to talk about as is. That said, I might make another video about the additions once Pristine Cut is out if I feel like it adds enough that I'm interested in talking about it. I won't know that until I've had the chance to play it myself. Stay tuned, and remember to subscribe so you don't miss future videos. Or don't, I'm not your dad. Until next time, take care.